set up one second. I'm getting so fast now. Now they stand myself. Glory. <clears throat> Blessed are you, Jehovah our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to engross ourselves in the words of the Torah. Barukata Yehovah Elohinu Malacharalem Asher Keshanu Bemitzvatav Betzivanu La Asak Bentere Torah. Please, Yehovah, make the Torah's words sweet in my mouth, mouth of all your people, the house of Israel. May we, your children, all of Israel, know your name and the name of your Messiah Yeshua. And may we study your Torah simply because it is good. Best are you, Yehovah, who gave us the Torah of truth. Amen. <clears throat> we who live in the shelter of Oyan, spend our nights in the shadow of Shaddai, who say to Adonai, our refuge, our fortress, our God in whom we trust. He will rescue us from the trap of the hunter, from the plague of calamities, and he will cover us with his pinions, and under his wings we will find refuge. His truth is a shield and protection. We will not fear the terrors of night or the arrow that flies by day or the plague that roams in the dark or the scourge that wreaks havoc at noon. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it won't come near us. Only keep our eyes open, and we will see how the wicked are punished. For we have made Adonai the Most High, who is our refuge, our dwelling place. No disaster will happen to us. No calamity will come near our tent, for he will order his angels to care for us and guard us wherever we go. And they will carry us in their hands so that we won't trip on a stone. We will tread down lions and snakes, young lions and serpents. We will trample underfoot. Jehovah says, because he loves me, I will rescue him. Because he knows my name, I will protect him. He will call on me, and I will answer him. And I will be with him when he is in trouble. I will extricate him and bring him honor. And I will satisfy him with long life. Show him my <coughs> salvation. Someone say amen. amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Just to ease your all's mind, we have air conditioning in the fellowship hall for the Oneg on Saturday, so you don't have to worry about it. Brother Michael fixed it for us. Hallelujah. He said if the man doesn't come, he wants to fix it. He crawled up those steps, fixed it, and then crawled backwards down those steps. So thank you, Michael. Glory to God. <clears throat> May the Lord bless you and continue to make you whole in Yeshua's name. Amen. Well, we are... Again, talking about the tree of life, we've been through the soil. We said that the soil is the most important part of the plant because the ground has to be prepared. It has to be chopped up. It has to be broken so that we can prepare that soil so that we can have a great fruit, a great crop. We then said that the seeds are the next important thing because that seed <clears throat> cannot be mingled. It must be a pure seed and it must be planted in the ground and that seed then must die. And we've been looking at the soil and the seed and we've been making this relationship to our spiritual lives because the tree of life in the natural is also reflecting what we should be doing in the supernatural. And then we know that the seed must then break through that ground and <clears throat> begin a radical root, and that radical root then begins to search for water. It begins to search for nutrients, and then we know that that complex root system is created. And all of that takes place underground, because God looks on the inside before he looks on the outside. And then from that, bursts through the ground, and we know that the trunk comes. And we found out that the trunk is the, the heart of us, where the Spirit of God, where the innermost part of the living water flows through us. So the trunk, we have realized, in those parts have a very important place to play in our lives. And then last week, we talked about the branches. <clears throat> and that we have located some sucker branches, and those sucker branches have to be what? Cut off and severed because they hijack nutrients and they hijacked the water and the food. And if you don't get rid of them, they can cause you to die and to decay. And so now we're going forth. We have just tonight, and then we have <clears throat> a couple more nights, but but we have those seven. So we have the, the soil, the seeds, the roots, the trunk, the branches. We're going to be talking about the leaves tonight, and then we have one more about the fruit, and then that would take care of the whole tree. So when we look at the leaves, again, in the English language, we can see lessons from the leaf because in the English la la uh, language, leaf can mean multiple things. 
correct? It can mean a, ex, uh, the way that you expand a table. You would add a leaf. It means that you can <clears throat> leave a room, okay? So you're leaving that room. Or you're off work, so you're taking a leave of absence. So the leaf here that we're talking about, of course, is the foliage of the tree. And when we refer to it as foliage, and I want you to get this right off the bat. When we look at it as foliage, we are looking at it in a plural sense. Since one leaf on its own cannot contribute significantly to the health of the tree. Amen. We could go home. Because it takes more than just one part. And a lot of times people think, well, you know, you won't miss me or I don't have to be there. Or so. You don't understand. The health of the tree depends on many leaves. One leaf cannot supply enough sunlight. One leaf cannot bring enough food to that tree in order for it to survive. So it is like us compounds its effectiveness when we're working in a larger group, right? We always say <clears throat> more hands, less work. Correct? And so in a larger group, in a very unified effort that we find then we're able to support the tree, the, the, the house, the church, your home cannot sustain itself by one leaf. Everyone has to be working together. Everyone has to be a unified part. If not, then there's something sick about that home or sick about that house or sick about that tree. So when the tree is healthy and all the leaves are there <clears throat> supporting that tree, it then in turn <clears throat> helps the environment that we live in. The only way that we can do what we're supposed to do for Blackstone is if we are a healthy tree where all the leaves are doing their job. If only one leaf is doing the job, <clears throat> then it not only affects the tree, it infects the environment, which infects everyone around them. So in this world of trees, as in our world, uh, looks can be deceiving because sometimes a tree looks good, but actually it's dead and it's dormant. And <clears throat> though it's dead and dormant, it can look like a tree that is alive. And not until you start seeing and investigating maybe the fruit that it's bearing, or over time it will reveal itself as being not quite alive. <clears throat> At first, remember, the houses looked the same. On the surface, it looked the same. The difference between the two houses was not in how it was built. It was how and where it was built on. So when the storm came, not till the storm came, did you see the difference? If no storm ever came, then you wouldn't know whether one was built on a foundation or one was built on sand. You wouldn't know because it was the same. Only when <clears throat> situations and circumstances arise. So a lot of times, trees look like they're alive, but when a storm comes, you will see that maybe there was some deadness to a tree because one will stand and bear the storm and one will start to break. Because we don't always climb the tree to investigate all those things that are up there. <clears throat> we just take it, oh, that's a beautiful tree. And then the next day, it's, it's gone, right? So you can't really tell if a tree is dead or alive from its appearance alone. So logically, we can assume that if it is the winter, the tree is dormant, correct? There, there's a purpose. The, the tree doesn't have any leaves. The tree does look barren. It does look absolutely dead. Right. But we have no concrete evidence until spring comes. Only until spring comes do we know whether it was dormant or whether it was dead. So when spring comes and we see that <clears throat> that only part of the tree is bringing forth leaves, then we say there's a problem with the tree. And a tree, it can it can just be like <clears throat> in one season. You can have leaves and it looks OK in one season. Then it goes through fall, then leaves fall and then it goes through winter and everything looks dead. And then spring comes back and all of a sudden it's not the same. And then you're saying, oh, there's something wrong. But through the fall in the winter, it looked just OK. Right. So the prime indicator <clears throat> of life. Is the bud that starts out as 
a mere bump on the branch. That's the sign that there's life on that branch and that bud is going to turn into a leaf. Now, if you look at it, again, God makes these connections with the natural tree in our soul, our lives, and spiritually and naturally. But also, we also said that we are just like the tree. As, as human beings, we are just like the tree. So just as life that begins inside the womb is small, right, just a bud, so to the outgrowth that appears on the branch as a <clears throat> very small bump harbors a life within it and soon comes bursting forth. So when does life begin? Not when the full baby is manifested, when the bud, because within the bud, there is life. Correct? So the leaf breaks forth, unfurls itself to provide a very unique shape designed for gathering sunlight. And we know that an oak tree and a maple tree and all the, and the palms, they all have different leaves, correct? <clears throat> and they're all designed for that tree to bring in that sunlight, to do what they're supposed to do. How many leaves? All of them. So like us, it is created <clears throat> with veins. Now, as you get older, you can see your veins more, <laughs> but <clears throat> um, they're all created with veins, all right? And through the veins, this life-sustaining nutrients are circulated to the tree. So that leaf has veins, and those veins gather that food from the sunlight and then brings it forth into the tree. That's the same thing with our, with our veins, right? <clears throat> if you have a clogged vein, a clogged artery, then it you know, not only just says, oh, I got a, a vein that's clogged, because you know an artery is a somewhat of a vein. I guess they consider it a little bit different because it's an artery, but it's still flowing and bringing forth something. If it's clogged, then it affects something, right? And so the size and the shape of the leaf are uniquely designed to produce the most effective use of the environment in which that tree grows. You have been designed exclusively where you're at, where you have been planted, for the purpose of that where you've been planted. So the environment that you are in, you're going to be more effective because that's where God planted you, right? So leaves have a function, and they also have a purpose. So their purpose is to gather that sunlight for photosynthesis, and that is the gathering of that sunlight that changes things into food. So during the process of converting these nutrients into sugar to feed the tree, the leaf absorbs carbon dioxide, and then it expels oxygen for us to breathe. Now, we have this symbiotic relationship with the tree and its leaves as we cannot live without oxygen. Is that not true? Do not we need oxygen, right? We need <clears throat> the life of oxygen. We need that life breathed into us. Like Adam and Eve, what did God do to Adam? He breathed into him life, right? Not only a spiritual life, but also a physical life. There had to be breath going into him. As spiritual as you want it to be, there also had to be a natural. <clears throat> so to get that system going... So not only do leaves produce oxygen for us to breathe. Again, we're relating this to our own selves. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to gather oxygen. You cannot live without the breath of God. You cannot live without God giving you breath. You, you cannot live on <clears throat> anything else because in this world is what? Carbon dioxide. What those leaves do is absorb pollution and impurities as they help clean the air. <clears throat> a city set on a hill, you don't have a light and put it under a bushel. What are you here for? To be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all throughout the earth. <clears throat> you are to do what? You, as righteous people, 
you as a tree with leaves are to be able to absorb the pollution, to absorb the, <clears throat> the carbon dioxide, the impurities, and change them and bring forth oxygen, which is why God says that he's not taking you out of this world, right? But yet he did say you're not of this world. You are in the world, but you're not of the world. And the reason why you're in the world is because as a tree, you have to be able to absorb the impurities. And I don't mean that you do them. It just means that you're able to live in the, in the world where there's impurities, where you can take that impurity, those <clears throat> pollutants, and change it into oxygen for people. You are to be the witness. We talked about that on Saturday. We are supposed to be in ministry in the valley, which means we go to the oppressed and the depressed and the demon. And what do we do? We take their impurities. We pray over them. We give them the word of God. We we speak to them good, <clears throat> good news. And then we give them back oxygen light. So we have this symbiotic relationship. Not only do we produce oxygen, but we also absorb. Now, one of our problems is, is that if all we do is absorb. Then don't turn it to oxygen, we die because carbon dioxide is poison. Too much is poison. So the leaves of certain trees can be used for food, okay, even though they absorb pollutants and change it around to bring oxygen. Those leaves can be used for food, not only for animals, but also for us. And many leaves are used for medicine purposes, so there's power in that tree. It's not just to beautify the, the area. <clears throat> there should be power in you. There's power in you that virtue should move through you, right? Food should be in you. You should be making a difference in the environment that God has given to you. Look at Ezekiel 47, verse 12, because, again, <clears throat> we talked about that God uses wood and trees and many over, what, 300 times within the word of God? Because there's a relationship. In Ezekiel 47, verse 12, it says, On both riverbanks will grow all kinds of trees. For what? For food. Their leaves will not dry up, nor will their fruit fail. There will be different kind of fruit each month. Because the water flows from the sanctuary. So that this fruit will be what? Edible. And the leaves will have healing properties. Which means God has already placed on this earth food and medicine. But where do we usually go for food and medicine? To man. And where do we need to go for food and medicine? To Yehovah. Right? And where, where spiritually, where do we usually go for food and medicine? To man. And where do we need to go? To him. He is our great physician, correct? In Revelation chapter 22, 2, it says, between the main street, <clears throat> so we have Ezekiel who's prophesying what he sees. We have Revelation where it's coming to pass. Between the main street and the river was the tree of life. So there's a main street when Yeshua comes back, right? <clears throat> and the main streets where things happening. So between the main street and the river was the tree of life. And the tree of life producing 12 kinds of fruit, a different kind every month, and the leaves of the tree were for healing the nations. And if you read it, the nations would come and eat from those trees. So again, we have this eternity because we live forever because of the trees. We live forever because what God has placed within those trees, right? And we go, we go back to the garden. <clears throat> they were going to live eternally as long as they ate from the tree of Life And when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they realized they were naked and then they were kicked out. And so, therefore, they couldn't live forever because they had to stop eating from the tree of life. But the tree of life and the fruit and the leaves are returning. It's returned in a spiritual way called Yeshua, but they also will return in a natural way. So during their life cycle, because <clears throat> we're talking about leaves, leaves also fall to the earth they also die. They also return precious minerals, salts, and nutrients stored in their cells back into the soil. So their purpose is not only while they're living. They also have a purpose when they're gone. 
what was originally produced by the tree now enhances the ground beneath the tree, and the cycle begins again. Make sure when your season is over that you're going to leave something that is going to sustain the tree. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart. And what that means is you're passing something down. <clears throat> it's still the same tree, but as the leaves can finish their cycle and go to the ground, and what do we do with leaves that go to the ground? We <laughs> rake them. But they're, they're designed to go to the ground and do what? Go back into that system of that tree that is there. What is our purpose? that we might leave a legacy, a legacy not of money, a legacy of not of homes, a legacy of not of what they can get or what they can have and what they can sell and what they can get rid of when you're done. But a legacy that what you have done all your life continues to feed them, and then they also go through the cycle, and they also bear buds, and they also have leaves, and the cycle continues. So like man, they return to their very origin as we return back. Man returns back to, to the ground. So throughout the ages, <clears throat> when we look at the Word of God and we look also at some uh, very powerful stories, uh, it really captures Jehovah's immeasurable concern for life because we know that He is concerned about life. Life trumps everything, correct? And many Jewish sages um, who impart great wisdom and see Jehovah's plan and even the most common activities, and if you ever read some Jewish uh, writings, you can see that in everything they find Yehovah, in everything. So I want to read you this little tiny story, um, and it talks about seeing uh, the smallest leaf that matters to Yehovah. <clears throat> it says, as a young boy, Rabbi Joseph would go with his father on walks to the woods, and one time, as they talked, the boy absentmindedly plucked a leaf off a tree and began to shred it between his fingers. How many ever done that? <clears throat> his father saw what his son was doing, but he went on talking. He spoke about the Baal Shem Tov, who taught how every leaf that blows in the wind, moving to the right and then to the left, how and when it falls and where it falls to Every motion for the duration of his existence is under the detailed supervision of the Almighty. Now, I want you to think about that. Because it says something like that in the New Testament, the Brick Shah, when he knows the hairs on your head, he knows when the sparrow falls, he, he clothes the lily. So that means every tree he's watching and every leaf that is grown he knows its motion. He knows when it's blowing and where it's blowing and what it's going to do. He knows where it's growing and how it's going to grow. He knows when it's going to fall and when it's not going to fall. He knows everything and every detail. I don't think we understand sometimes that every detail of our lives, if he has every detail of a tree and every detail of a bird and every detail of a flower, then certainly every detail of our life has already been the plan of Yehovah. Detailed supervision of the Almighty. That concern the Creator has for each thing, his father explained, is the divine spark that sustains its existence. Everything is with divine purpose. Everything is of concern to the ultimate goal of the entire cosmos. Now, the father gently chided, look how you mistreated. So absent-mindedly, Almighty's creation. He formed it with purpose, gave it a divine spark. It has its own self and its own life. And now tell me, how is it that the I am of the leaf any less than your own I am? Is your I am any less than someone else's I am? Is the life that God has placed in you any less than the life that he's placed in anyone else? Is the life that he's placed in us any less than the life that he's placed in Everything has a connection. We always say everything has a connection. And we really need to understand that everything does have a connection. 
The same God who created the heaven and the earth, the same God who created us, created every leaf. He created every tree. I could take you back to Genesis, right? And the day of creation, what did he do? Every seed-bearing tree he created. Every part that we see in this world has a purpose. And as we study the tree, we see this incredible purpose that each part of it provides for us in a very supernatural way. The ground, we have to <clears throat> plow our ground. We have to fertilize our ground. We have to make sure our life is able to receive the seed. And when that seed comes, it has to be able to not be mingled. It cannot be unequally yoked. It has to be in its place. It has to then break forth from its shell. It has to die in order for it to create a root. And that root then seeks for great nutri uh, nutrients and water. We seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And once that root system is there, then we sprout out that we can make a difference. And, and, and we sprout out and become what God wants us to become. And inside of us, our innermost part of our being, flows that living water for what purpose? That we might create branches to reach out. And those branches then create buds. And those buds create leaves. And those leaves bring food back, not only when it's alive, but also when it's gone. So as we look to Yehovah's word for the significance of the leaf, Yehovah conveys two very clear messages through the leaf. Two very clear messages. The first one is, is that the leaf is a sign of prosperity. Now, not prosperity in that just, you know, money, because when we think of prosperity, we just think of money. But you can have a prosperous life, right, <clears throat> and still live, you know, moderately. You don't have to be rich, rich, rich to have prosperity. <clears throat> so the leaf is not only a sign of prosperity, but it's also a sign of the times. In Psalms chapter 1, verse 3, it says, They are like trees planted by streams. They bear their fruit in season. Their leaves never wither. Everything they do succeeds. So they're an example of prosperity, that everything that our hand touches, it should, it should prosper, that we should be living a life that is not down and out. And I'm not talking about what we have. I'm just talking about no matter what we're going through, the joy of the Lord should be our strength, right? Count it all joy, Paul says. So our lives should be different than anyone else's life. And then also we find in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 28, he who trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like sprouting leaves. So we don't have a contrast here. It just means the purpose of life is not what you think it is. The purpose of a tree's life is to what? Is to grow, sustain, do its job and its purpose, Take out the impurities of this world and bring forth life-giving oxygen so that the world can live and the environment can be changed. And when the life cycle is done, it's not discarded as not meaning anything. It falls to the ground to only become part of that ground, which means it continues on that generational process. So when we look at a green leaf, a green leaf is an indicator of new life and vitality, right? It's green. It's fresh. It's, a, it's alive. It's green because of the time of the year and the right amount of water and also light. If you don't have the right amount of water and light, then the leaf no longer turns green. It can turn yellow. It can turn brown. It can just be dead. So you have a, a bright green leaf, you know it's getting enough water, it's getting enough sunlight, it's not getting too much water, it's <clears throat> and, and you know the time of the year because in the winter it's not going to be green because it has a life cycle, right? All of you are planting, you're planting, you have your cucumbers and your squash and all that, you know it won't last all year long, right? <clears throat> if you plant a corn, what do you got to do with corn? You got to pluck it. And when you're done plucking it and you eat it, what do you do with the corn that's still there in the ground? You just say, oh, it's going to come, it's going to continue to grow. No, you, you get rid of it and make it into compost and make it part of the ground again, right? <clears throat> because it has a life cycle. It, if it is green, that means it's early in its life. We always talk about people being too green, wet behind the ears. What does that mean? 
you're young. I was at Lowe's the other, the other day, and uh, <clears throat> someone came up. I was at the pro desk, and I said, oh, help this young man. And he was like, oh, thank you very much, because he was older than me. And uh, so I said, yeah. And he, he was saying about, well, how old are you? And I said, I'm 60. And he said, yes, you're just a young pup. I'm 85. And I said, yes, I'm just a young pup, because you're 85. So I was looking for someone else, that they could be a young pup. But you're green. You're wet behind the ears. You have not yet. And now, <clears throat> a lot of times, you know, um, that's when you're most uh, powerful. It is in this green state that it's soft, resilient, and full of life. We know as we get older, we're not as resilient. We're not as soft. We're not as full of life. And that's not, and that's not to say that, we, that we're, you know, just uh, crawling around. But it does know that we do have cycles, seasons. Come on, you're not living forever, people. The change is the change. The season is the season. That doesn't mean you have to dig your grave early. It just means <clears throat> that you have to understand some things, right? And so a green leaf is very obvious, young, vital, can do some things that the Older leaf cannot, because a dry leaf is almost any color than green. Almost any other color than green. And it's sometimes it's robed in majestic colors because it's signifying its usefulness in life is about to end. For everything, there is a season. Which is what do we do when we see that our the color of our hair is leaving. What do we do? We color it because we don't want people to know we're coming to the end. Right? And they're like, oh, you look young. Thank you. Me and Clara are doing a good job. Because you don't want to reveal the cycle of life. It's an old thing. Just don't worry about it. You know what it is. And Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8 says, For everything there is a season, a right time for every intention under heaven. Time to be born, time to die, time to plant, time to uproot, time to kill, and a time to heal, time to tear down, a time to build, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to throw stones, and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, a time to refrain, a time to search, a time to give up, a time to keep, a time to discard, a time to tear, a time to sow, a time to keep silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. That describes your life. You've had every emotion, right? The thing is, we can't stay in one of those too long sometimes. We have to know how to do the balance. But something as simple as a leaf can bear the good news of new life. And through an olive leaf, if you remember in Genesis chapter 8, 6 through 11, what does Noah wait for in order to know that land is found? An olive leaf, right? The dove is not picking up an animal, not bringing something, a worm. Look, I found a worm. Look, there's a butterfly. No, <clears throat> a leaf. An olive leaf. After 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark which he had built, and he sent out a raven which flew back forth under the water had, until the water had dried up from the earth, and then he sent out a dove to see if the water had gone from the surface of the ground. But the dove found no place for her feet to rest, so she returned to him in the ark. Because of the water still covered the whole earth, he put out his hand, took her, and brought her in to him in the ark. He waited another seven days <clears throat> and again sent the dove out from the ark. Verse 11, the dove came into him in the evening, and there in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the water had cleared from the earth. He knew that new life was now being birthed because it is a fresh, green olive leaf. Noah had confirmation that trees had come forth on the earth, and in this season, we're now producing leaves. He knew that the season of the ark and the rain and the flood is over. 
And the Brit Kanashah, <clears throat> the leaves also figure as the signs of the time. We read this before in Luke chapter 21, 29 through 36. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree, indeed all the trees. And as soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves that summer is near. <clears throat> because there's buds and they're going to unfurl these leaves. In the same way, when you see these things taking place, you are to know that the kingdom of God is near. Yes, I tell you that this people will certainly not pass away before it has all happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will certainly not pass away. But keep watch on yourselves, on your hearts, <clears throat> or your hearts will become dulled by carousing, drunkenness. Let me find where I'm at. And the worries of everyday living. And that day will be sprung upon you suddenly like a trap. But keep watch on yourselves or your hearts will become dulled by carousing, drunkenness, and the worries of everyday living. And that day will be sprung upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will close in on everyone. And no matter where they live throughout the whole earth, stay alert, always praying that you will have the strength to escape all the things that will happen and to stand in the presence of the Son of Man. So we know it's all going to happen to everyone, right? Now, what we tend to do sometimes is limit our understanding of the leaf. Because we see a tree, and we say, that's a nice tree, and we move on. We don't make that connection spiritually. We don't uh, relegate it to a lowly position on the tree. What we do in this untrained eye is we only look for that which looks good, like in the fall, and for signifying when spring is here. We don't care about the tree in the winter. We don't care about the tree after the leaves have fallen off, right? No one goes and says, look how that beautiful bare tree is so beautiful. People go to the Blue Ridge Mountains to look at what? Changing of the leaves, right? They don't go and say, listen, right now there's no leaves on. Let's go there and just see this bunch of bear trees. That is just, I'm so excited about that. The leaf that we kind of curse every fall when we rake them, blow them, right, actually sacrifices its own life to return to the ground. It sacrifices its life. In its death, it brings nourishment to the earth. In its death, it supports the one that brought it to life. Think about death a little bit differently. It's sacrificing itself for the next generation. It's sacrificing itself and that which it's given so that generation can go on and continue to produce. It doesn't leave. It just goes in the ground. It becomes part of the tree and the soil. It becomes part of that nutrients. And yes, <clears throat> we know spiritually we will see <clears throat> each other again, but the life cycle goes on. And when we don't see the signs of the times, when we don't pay attention to what <clears throat> the Bible says in Luke, we get lost in it. We tell people, you know, you're not going to live forever. What we're trying to say is you need to pay attention because you're not going to live forever. And, <clears throat> and if you don't pay attention, there's one day the season of your life is going to be over. So you need to be paying attention because it is appointed unto man once to die. So when we only look at the tree in its full glory, when it is full and lush, when the leaves change colors with the seasons, we miss Jehovah's message, the message of new life, the message of prosperity, the message of good news, the message of his timetable. And what we need to do is we need to stop ignoring God's voice because creation itself teaches us. Every season he's teaching us there's a life cycle. Every, every season he teaches us. There will be those who will sacrifice. There will be those who will go on. But it continues on. So we have to stop ignoring Jehovah's voice, and we have to listen to what he has to say in the tree's process. And we've been going through the soil, the seeds, <clears throat> the roots, the, the trunk, the branches, and now the leaves, and next week the fruit. And each one of those we have pulled aside the natural understanding of it, and then we applied it to our life in a spiritual way, and there's such great power in that tree. When the bud comes forth and the leaf comes into fullness, we know that spring is upon us. 
And why then must we have blinders on our eyes about the current signs of the time when God tells us that we can watch the trees and it will tell us? Yehovah gives us the signs of the times. And he tells us that he's coming soon. He tells us to keep our eyes glued on Israel because really the main factor in the second coming and all that's going to happen is in Israel. He tells us to watch Jerusalem so we may know what is happening in Yehovah's economy. We're so busy watching here, but here is not biblical prophecy. We might be involved in it because of what's go- what Israel is going through, but the center of everything is Israel. Yehovah's not coming back to Montana. He's not coming back to Virginia. Where's he coming? To Jerusalem, to the Mount of Olives. That is the center. That's the focal point. <clears throat> so who cares? Really, keep it in context, what's happening here? What's happening there? What's going on there? Because that's going to reveal to us what's happening to the tree there, right? So Jehovah has given us this sign. Look at, look at Mark chapter 13, 28 through 31. Now let the fig tree teach you its lesson. <clears throat> let the fig tree what? Teach you its lesson. Let this tree teach you its lesson. There's not any of you can walk out of your house without seeing a tree. Let it teach you the lesson. Next time you see a a tree uh, dying, let it teach you the lesson. I have a, just noticed that the other day, I have a tree that's trying to live and trying to die at the same time. And for the first time, I noticed that a great big branch has broken but has lodged at the top. So here's a broken, dead branch that really, if it fell, could crush the car or hurt someone, right? But it's being held up by, I don't know, is it a live branch or a dead branch? So if I didn't pay attention to it, it looked like it's part of the tree, but actually it's not. It's showing me something. But even dead branches can look like they're part of a tree when we're being held up by people who are holding it up, but actually they're dead. And so sooner or later, that will fall. And when it falls, it will be a mess. Right? So Mark is telling us, let the fig tree teach you its lesson. When its branches begin to sprout and leaves appear, you know the summer is approaching. In the same way we read it, when you see all these things happening, you are to know that the time is near, right at the door. Yes, I tell you that this people will certainly not pass away before all these things happen. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will certainly not pass away. So we've learning, and we have learned seven lessons from the leaves of the tree. And if you notice, we learned seven lessons from soil, seven from the seed, seven from the um, root, seven from the trunk, seven from the branches, and now we're learning seven lessons from the tree. And here they are. Number one, leaves turn toward the light for all nourishment, but it is not enough for just one leaf to turn to light. We all need to turn to light. You might be following God, and you might have a great relationship with the Lord, But in order for this church to be changed, all leaves must go to the light. It requires that all leaves working in unity to gain the most benefit from the light. If this trunk, this house is to continue to survive and be healthy, all leaves must bring forth sunlight in. Which is why, God, we talk about the Sabbath, and the Sabbath is great because it is a commandment. You are to honor it, you are to obey it. <clears throat> but then you fail to realize what Hebrews says. What does Hebrews say? Forsake what? Not the assembling of yourselves together as it will be in the last day. Now, look at that. In the Brit Kadashah, when he's talking about forsaking not the assembly, it's a given that you're supposed to be in Sabbath. 
But that commandment about forsaking is talking about times when we are to gather together beyond the Sabbath. And when we look at Wednesday night, and this is not to <clears throat> make any, or just to say it, Wednesday night, low. Why? Because people think, as long as I'm in Sabbath, I'm okay, but God tells us not to forsake. So that means we're, when the church is gathering, when the corporate body is supposed to be here, <clears throat> then we're supposed to be here. Because there's a lot of meat that is given to you on Wednesday that if you don't come, you don't get. Therefore, then the leaves are not getting everything. Because we look at it and we say, well, I can decide when and when not. Forsake not the assembly. Because it takes more than just one leaf. We must turn to light for our nourishment. In Genesis chapter 1, 3, and 4 says, Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. So he created the light because it is what? It is good. <clears throat> Why? Because what does light do? Bring nourishment. Now, we can walk down that trail, and who is light? He is light. In John 9, 5, while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. So our eyes must be fixed on Yeshua, our source of light. And what happens is <clears throat> sometimes we focus our, our eyes on something else, and that becomes our source. Our livelihood becomes our source. Our family becomes our source. Our <clears throat> our Jobs become our source. And I got news for you. They're not your source. Your job's not taking you to heaven. Your family's not taking you to heaven. Your children, your grandchildren are not taking you to heaven. Hello? Your money's certainly not taking you to heaven. So we have to work together as leaves. You know, in, the, in Acts chapter 2, they gather together in the upper room, together, unified. Not, not one was missing. Wherever Yehovah told them to go, they went. And they gathered together, and the power of the Spirit of God fell. Why? Because there were leaves that were looking for sunlight. And they gathered together, and there was power in unity. Number two thing that we have learned, <clears throat> a lesson, is that leaves give back as much as they receive. They take in carbon dioxide, and they release oxygen for us to live. And without trees, we could not live. We could not breathe. Do you understand that as witnesses, that if, one, if you are taken, if witnesses were taken, this world would, would explode in, in wickedness? Because it could not survive the carbon dioxide. To remove the Ruach Kakadesh, the world is, would die. <clears throat> and we see that the world is dying. We see how it's dying because it's removing the oxygen but keeping the carbon dioxide. And there's not enough leaves to do the exchange. And in fact, what is happening is the leaves are not giving out oxygen. They're just taking in carbon dioxide. In Luke chapter 6, <clears throat> verse uh, 30 and 31, if someone asks you for something, give it to him. If someone takes what belongs to you, don't demand it back. Treat other people as you would like them to treat you. So leaves give back as much as they receive. They're gathering but then through their veins, they give back to the tree. They don't hold it and say, I'm a leaf and I'm going to hold on to it. They know that the trunk needs it. They know that the roots need it. They know that the soil needs it, right? They know the branches need it. Number three, when a leaf dies, it brings life to another. And <clears throat> the nutrients that are poured back into the tree... Again, we blow them, we rake them, and I'm not telling you to, you can't blow them or rake them. I'm just saying, because <clears throat> like in my house, there's a lot of trees. Um, but they are in purpose to bring back those nutrients. Because in that leaf, even though they're dead, they, they are still filled with nutrients. So it invests itself in the next generation. Again, what are we to do? But where are we in a society? It's all about self, isn't it? It's all about us. And in reality, we need to be investing in <clears throat> those who are coming behind us. Everything we do should be an investment. Everything that we do should be for them, right? <clears throat> we have a church for not just us, but we maintain the church for the next generation. 
and that generation to follow. We speak the word of God. We live the way the word of God wants us to live, not because of us. It's not just about us getting into heaven. It's about us being an example so that when we <clears throat> sacrifice ourselves, the investment is still there to the next generation. We have to invest in the next generation for we are a source of light to them and what we give of ourselves. We are to be like the tree, return what has been given to us through wisdom, through patience, through understanding, through opportunity. We all sit here, whatever season you're in, spring, summer, fall, or winter, and you have great wisdom, patience, understanding, and opportunity. <clears throat> Especially in that latter season, You've been through a lot. You know a lot more. Do you remember when the elderly, I'm not saying that because I'm headed that way, but the elderly were revered? Where you went and your grandparents had something to offer you? Some wisdom of how to act, some wisdom of what to do, some wisdom of how to <clears throat> whatever it was, go out and do this, go out and do that. Spent time with your grandparents because they had something. And what, what has changed in our society? The wisdom, the patience, the understanding, the opportunity is looked down on. It's looked down on because they think they know more than us, but yet they have not lived where we have lived and gone where we have gone and experienced what we've experienced. And it really is only until the end, if we don't catch it early, and I'm talking about even on our own selves, <clears throat> if we don't catch it, then at the end, you, you've missed great opportunity, great wisdom, great patience, great opportunity, great wisdom <clears throat> that could have been poured into you and passed down before the leaf season is over. Or what would you be? Blown to the curb to be sucked up, raked away violently, not giving back what's supposed to be given back. So when a leaf dies, it does not die in vain. Number four, when a leaf dies, it brings life to another. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is united with the Messiah, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Look, what has come is what? Fresh and new. Yeshua sacrificed his life as the leaf, right? And fell to the ground to nourish the tree so that the tree could sprout buds Create limbs and branches and buds so the process continues on. In Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, then so far as your former way of life is concerned, you must strip off your old nature because your old nature is thoroughly rotted by its deceptive desires. And you must let your spirits and minds keep being renewed and clothe yourselves with the new nature created to be godly, which expresses itself in the righteousness and holiness that flow from the truth. The Bible, in Proverbs, Ecclesiastes talks about <clears throat> the older man when they're gray and the wisdom that they had. Because, and a lot of it's, you know, just society and the way the Antichrist is going, but, but there's not that respect or there's something missing. Now, we know that what God is saying is when, before he comes back, there's going to be a revival where the sons are returning back to their fathers, right? And what that basically means is, is that there's going to be this revelation of, <clears throat> of what God has been saying, that that cycle is important. Number five, what could be poisonous to us in life is life to the leaf. Carbon dioxide is poisonous to us in large doses. But the same gas is life for the leaf, and in his infinite wisdom, Yehovah created a perfect balance. <clears throat> so let me just say this. We know the world is wicked, right? But we have to live in it. So the balance is there. So you'd rather, if you, if you could, again, pull back the, the veil and you see heaven, heaven, you want to live in heaven, you want to live on the earth. Well, uh, it would be a no-brainer. I mean, not just because of the location, how beautiful it is, 
nothing but righteousness and holiness and no lying, no gossip, no nothing. And if we all could go at one time, that'd be great. We're out of here. But we can't because we're the ones that exchange carbon dioxide for life. But we have to live it in a perfect balance. We also have to strive for the balance in our lives. Yes. <clears throat> what does Rabbi Paul say? Rabbi Paul says, everything is permitted, you say? Maybe, but not everything is helpful. Everything is permitted? Maybe, but not everything is edifying. Now, again, you have to read what he said. Did he say everything was permitted? Did he say everything is permitted? He said, you say everything is permitted. And then he says, maybe, depending on what you think everything is. But not everything is helpful. Everything is permitted? Maybe, because I don't know what you think everything is. But not everything is edifying, <clears throat> which means we have to find the balance. You cannot suck on carbon dioxide too long. Too much of a good thing can become toxic and in the natural can cause an overdose or an imbalance. M&Ms are good. Milk duds are great. And if I ate an M&M &M or a milk dud or a box or three to work it off, but if your diet was a milk dud, what would you become? A milk dud. Right? So you, you, you can't say, oh, it's a good, it's good, it's good. Too much of a good thing can become toxic. So you have to choose what is good according to the word of the Lord, right? Number six, the leaf is a sign of the times. It comes forth in the spring and withers and falls in autumn which just means we cannot stop the seasons from arriving. Really, I don't care how much hair color, I don't care how much exercise you do, guess what? You are in a decaying operation, right? <clears throat> you are decaying. That's just the way it is. Some decay faster, some don't decay. Some don't, <clears throat> are not in a decay, but then something happens. So, but my point is, you cannot stop the seasons from arriving. I don't care what pill you take. I don't care how many pills you take. I don't care if you freeze yourself. I don't care what you do. But we can certainly read the signs of the times and prepare ourselves accordingly, right? And decide, listen, I really need to get some things straight. You know, you can be mad when you're young, but when you get older, you realize you might not have tomorrow and you might not see them. That anger is not worth it, right? So you do some changing. Because you know you're re arriving in a season. <clears throat> How foolish we are to resist change. How foolish we are to stop winter from coming because we love the fall so much. How foolish we are to resist the winds of change. Remember... When we started the study, we talked about, are you an oak? Are you a palm tree? And, you know, are you struggling with, are you bending and compromising? Are you so rigid that you break off and you're not willing to flow with the Lord? <clears throat> Think about that. Number seven, the leaf is delicate in the spring, hardy in the summer, dried and withered, withered in the winter. Its end is made clear from its beginning, and it is part of Yehoah's cycle of life. He went from the end back to the beginning. He knew Yeshua would be born. He also knew Yeshua would be crucified. He knew that you would be born. He also knows when you will go. There's no shock to him. There's shock to us, but not shock to him. So from its beginning until its last days, it does not <clears throat> worry or fear for what it is to come 
but it is faithful to endure even in its death. The tree knows spring is coming. The tree knows summer is coming. The tree knows fall is coming. The spring knows winter is coming. And it doesn't worry about it. The lilies don't worry about it. The sparrow doesn't worry about it. I worry about my hair, but the hair don't worry about it. If we are in right relationship with Yehovah, we too can endure even unto death without fear or worry. And in the death to ourselves, receive life in him. These lessons are powerful. Something so small, something so insignificant as a bud on a branch of a tree can grow into something noteworthy, something powerful. The leaf is our example. And the leaf becomes a leaf when it's too painful for it to remain as a bud. It has to break forth. Change will take place. You can't stop it. Don't fight it. But take each season for what it is and leave something. You know, whether we like change or not, it comes. Right? Even unto death, we are to embrace the gift that Yehovah has given to us. For he endured even unto death so that in his death there would be life. So we have to give back as much, if not more, than what we receive. Freely you have received. Freely what? Freely give. So neither the leaf nor the tree it grows on has control over its own life. And when will you realize? When will you realize? The sun sets and rises, and it doesn't ask you. Has the son ever came, knocked on your door, and said, listen, I want to get up. Can you, you want to get up now? No. Storms never ask you, can it come? They come, they go, right? Life is here, life happens. So the leaf nor the tree it grows on has control over its own life. There's one who has control. And when we understand that Yehovah has control over our lives, and then we just walk the journey. Yes, there will be times of joy, and there's times of mourning. He says it, right? Times of sowing, times of reaping. Well, it's a season. Who of us can make even a hair on our head grow? Listen, I've tried. Who of us can make a flower come forth out of nothing? None of us. Who of us can breathe life into dirt and create man? Certainly not any of us. Can't do it. So like the tree and the leaf, we are absolutely helpless without Yehovah. Just turn to someone to remind them you are helpless without Yehovah. So here's Yehovah who's calling us, and it's just too painful to remain a bud. We have to move to the next season. Life, and write this down, life as you know it is not life as he wants it. Life as you know it is not life as he wants it. Because we have to learn to die to ourselves so that we may receive life. And we only receive life through saying yes to Yeshua, the promised Messiah. And though we live in a world of carbon dioxide, we are the ones who are able to absorb a little and then change it into oxygen. And really, hasn't he done that with your life? Hasn't he taken some of that stuff in your life and turned it around for his glory and for his testimony? So let me just say this and I'll close. Because he lives, we live. Right? Because he lives, we live. Understand the power of a leaf. Understand the power of the tree. Amen. Let's stand before Yehovah. Oh, I do have some uh, homework for you. Jimmy Dale's not here. I told him. He said he had to go home. I said, I can't believe you're not going to pass it out. You're messing up. Uh, can you pass it out for me, Brother Wayne? 
You're welcome. Thank you. Next week, the fruit. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain birth beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery. Makes me sing, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Your love is surprising, cause I can feel it rising. All the joy that's growing deep inside of me. Every time I see you, all your goodness shines through. I can feel this your soul rising up in me. Hallelujah. 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 Your love makes me sing. Hallelujah. 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 Your love makes me sing. One, two, three. Praise Jehovah. Enjoy the rest of your week. See y'all on Sabbath.